the BNB Chain and Infium Founders Academy is a 12-week program, and we selected from you know over hundreds of applications in the BN, uh, the BNB Chain network. In our network, we selected founders that we believe could create unicorns in the Web3 space. We started this February 14th, and we're in the 11th week of it, so we're almost done. Uh, there's a graduation on May 23rd, and you're invited with the rest of the VCs to come to the pitch session that day. I'll, I'll send you the invite. But one of the topics that you presented, you know, I've done, you've done a lot of presentations in the last month, but the one that you talked about, you know, the financial infrastructure and, you know, kind of doing a heart surgery, I thought that was a really good one. Or if you want to address any other changes in the Web3 system and how should one think about launching ventures. But these ventures are not real pure startups. They raised about three quarters of a million to you know, a few million in, in venture capital already. And we're just trying to accelerate them to the next level. So we can do keynote if you want or chat or you can do a presentation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm happy to kind of share kind of my core thesis really around this entire space, right? So, you know, to me, like there's, you know, one of the easiest references that you can use is, you know, you can go to miko.com. So that's my kind of homepage. And what you'll see, it's, it says there that open source financial infrastructure will make the world more consensual, fair, just, inclusive, transparent, and innovative, right? So that's really kind of like what I believe, you know, and I think that open source software has kind of always been doing so, uh, you know, and open source, this thesis of mine actually transcends blockchain itself, obviously, because open source financial infrastructure is really the platform for human innovation. So, you know, if you kind of look at my fund, Thesis, which is gumi-cryptos.com. You know, I'm a managing partner with Gumi Cryptos. You know, we've been investing since 2018. We deployed our $21 million fund one into the crypto winter of 2018, 2019. You know, got a number of uh, substantial unicorns out of that, including uh, OpenSea, Agoric, Credo Networks, Yield Guild Games, One Inch, Hashflow, and Lit Protocol. These are all very, very early stage investments, you know, seed, pre-seed, first check style investments. So, you know, what we believe is that the internet itself will become the single largest market in human history, that it will be rebuilt on a foundation of new protocols that will protect and coordinate the transfer of digital assets, resources, and intellectual property, generate consensus and incentivize network participants, as well as decentralized ownership, right? So it's a bit of a mouthful, Right. But in a way, you could think of it as the idea of, you know, essentially saying that you're Web3 without using the term Web3. I actually have a slightly different or orthogonal perspective on the idea of three, which is that, you know, my theory on Web3 is that I'm a little contrarian about it because I don't actually believe there was a Web2. Uh, when people started saying Web2, Web2, I really was like, this is already part of the Web right? It's just stuff that you guys didn't know was in here, right? So it's really just, uh, you know, it's just the web. It's all been the web, right? Uh, I do think that we are in a new phase. And I think the phase we're in is disruptive. But the way I count to three is that there's an era of innovation that actually generated uh, what I call megacorn companies, right? Megacorn being a trillion dollar company, right? So the first wave of this was actually driven by Moore's Law, which is base layer innovation on transistor doubling. So Moore's law cites that transistors effectively double in density on a transistor die over typically about an 18 month cycle, right? So the Moore's law era actually spawned both Microsoft and Apple, which are these mega corn companies, right? But it turns out that the internet era actually was driven by a different law, which was Metcalf's law. So we, you know, so for me, the way I count to three is I start with Moore's law. The second wave actually is Metcalf's law. And really the thing that we believe is that we believe that this whole Web3 phenomenon is actually an extension of this second wave, which is really more like just the redistribution of the value that uh, accrues within a network effect, right? So if you think about that, so for, from our perspective, we kind of nickname this thing Nakamoto's law, which is basically the idea that the value of a decentralized network can actually be distributed to the network, right? And can be owned by the network, right? So this actually becomes 
more of a variant of a network effect distribution model, not just for the uh, beneficiary of the companies, but for the beneficiary of the users, right? So that becomes super interesting because ultimately what it means is it means that you should have exponential growth of Web3 applications if they're designed properly. So I think that's a pretty important uh, kind of core principle, you know, and uh, I think it's pretty uh, significant. Uh, you know, I just got a comment from uh, Lisa Loud, who uh, co-founded uh, the Metcalf Foundation with Bob Metcalf in 2019, right? So I, I super appreciate that. Uh, obviously, Mac Bob Metcalf is, uh, you know, legendary and, you know, web, you know, what I consider to be sort of an original internet uh, pioneer. So, you know, super excited to hear about that. Uh, you know, definitely think that is sort of the foundation of the rules of the game that we're playing now, right? So the, 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 my, my point being the following, right, which is that, you know, when we talk about Web3, the only thing that I'd like to say is that it's obvious that Web2 has run its course, right? And my, I'd like to cite as evidence that um, guys like Jack Dorsey don't want to run a company called Twitter, right? He, and he doesn't even want to run a company called Square. He actually wants to run a company called Block, right? That's what he wants, right? So that's interesting to know, you know. And then if you look at someone like uh, Zuckerberg, like he doesn't want to run a company called Facebook. He wants to run a company called Meta, right? So like, why is that, right? And basically, it's really that all of the Web2 founders are actually running away from their creations, right? Because they really don't want to spend half of their lives testifying in front of Congress as to why their organizations are sole purpose is to, you know, uh, breach the privacy rights of their users and, you know, basically, you know, extract and exploit, uh, you know, financial capability out of them, right? So, so you know, we've reached the kind of bitter end of it. The other day, Elon Musk tweeted, Instagram makes its users depressed and Twitter makes its users angry. Which one is better, right? And the thing that's ironic is, is I sincerely believe that Elon Musk's life philosophy is that being angry is better than being depressed, right? So I think, I think he was trying to argue that Twitter is better than Instagram. But what if the correct answer is none of the above? Like, what if the correct answer is, I would like to not be angry or depressed, right? And so then the question becomes, well, what do we do about that, right? And to me, the difference between Web 2 and Web 3 is very interesting, which is the difference is that in Web 2, basically the uh, value accrual is really that the, the companies own the users, Right. And in Web3, the users basically own the company, project, value, whatever it is. Right. So I think that, you know, if you look at it in the context of gaming, I like to say that Web2 games, you know, the, the games own the players. And in Web3, the players own the game. Right. And if you kind of extend the definition of game to anything that's happening in Web3, social media, you know, SaaS applications, whatever you want. Right. It's really the players in quotes that own the game in quotes. Right. So whatever it is that we're all playing we are the owners, right? So that really speaks to this idea of redistribution. And I think that's the reason why this platform has the potential for virality, right? But I think we've been through one cycle and I think the cycle is super important, which is that when we think about cycles, one of the things to understand is the Bitcoin halving. So when you think about the Bitcoin halving, this kind of super cycle is actually scheduled to occur again in April of 2024, which is actually about, you know, it's a, April's last month. So it's about a year from now, we're going to see, you know, the, uh, another kind of super cycle. So, you know, when you think about the supply having on Bitcoin, we're actually reaching a point where we're far along the uh, asymptote of the fundamental limit, right? So we're really actually pretty far up already. So if you really kind of do the math, the reality is that the problem is, is that the supply cut isn't necessarily that large and it's not necessarily enough to trigger a fundamental restructuring of the market. But what I would argue is this, is that one of the things that's very important in the theory, in the game theory of Bitcoin is basically the shelling point. So the Thomas Shelling point, Nobel Prize winning game theoretician, basically said that people playing a game, in quotes again, uh, can actually coordinate without communicating, right? So they don't have to communicate in order to coordinate because what they do is they naturally predict what other people will do, right? So, you know, if you look at the original Satoshi Nakamoto Byzantine General's problem, 
the generals have to understand when to attack the city. So in the Byzantine generals, they require to send messages through an untrusted city. That's the Byzantine general's problem, right? That Satoshi Nakamoto largely solved with the Bitcoin white paper. But the thing that's so interesting when you look at a shelling point is that a shelling point doesn't even require a message to go through the city, right? And basically what happens when you think about the super cycle is you realize that every single time Bitcoiners have essentially decided to buy Bitcoin uh, coinciding with the halving. So it, in effect, the thing to understand is that the Bitcoin halving is actually a Thomas Schelling game theoretical coordination point that doesn't require communication among the players, right? So, the, so if you look at it from that perspective, you know, and I, I'm not like a Bitcoin maxi, but what I do understand is I understand that Bitcoin is the reserve bank for the metaverse and that Ethereum is basically the commercial bank for the metaverse, right? The investment bank, right? So it's an investment bank, right? So like, you know, uh, we don't really yet have a retail bank for the metaverse, but I think those are coming, you know, but I, I to me, like, I feel like the important underscoring of this is, is that, you know, we are going to potentially see this kind of catalytic wave, right? Because one of the problems, so I gave a opening keynote at the Crypto Econ Day uh, sponsored by Filecoin, you know, at the consensus conference in Austin, Texas. And part of the thing I was comparing is I was comparing the crypto economics uh, to normal economics. And what I compared is I compared uh, Definity, uh, which is the ICP ticker, you know, and to, to Apple stock, right? So if you compare them over the lifetime, what you'll kind of observe is you'll observe that there's one project who sells tokens and spends money Right. And then there's another project. I'm going to use the term token to mean Apple stock. Right. But like there's another project that makes money and then buys their token in quotes. Right. Which is obviously Apple. Right. Is make money, buy their token. Right. So like, you know, we're all part of the BNB chain ecosystem. We have friends there and et cetera. Right. So like, you know, one of the amazing things that the BNB token has been doing is that Binance itself has been buying back the token. Right. And the exchange makes money. And then Binance buys back the token and then they burn, right? So like, you know, that's that's the difference between like a valid economy of any type and an invalid economy, which is basically if if you take a, uh, you know, if you take a store of value or a unit of account, right? Like a cryptocurrency, and all you do is you just sell it all the time and spend money, then that will eventually go to zero, right? And then if you continuously buy it over a long enough period of time, you know, it will eventually go up. It kind of has to, right? Because you're basically deliberately cutting the supply, right? So, you know, so that it's, to me, the thing that was a little unfortunate about a talk like that is that like Crypto Econ Day is a day where you hear from speakers like Tarun Chitra of Gauntlet. You hear, you hear these incredibly, the speaker after me was talking about agent-based modeling, you know, of cryptographic systems, right? So it's a day when you hear these incredibly sophisticated economic mechanisms, you know, and you really, you know, hurt your head trying to understand these kind of mathematical models, right? Whereas my talk was a lot more like, if the wheels are going this way, the bus goes this way. And if the wheels go this way, then the bus goes this way, right? And like, it's kind of an absurdly simple talk that I gave, right? But to me, the reason why I gave such a talk is twofold, one of which is the previous year at this time, I actually brought my son to consensus. He actually attended the SBF talk on FTX. You know, FTX was flying super high at the time. And when I asked him how it went, his comment to me was, some people like to talk in order to show how smart they are, right? Which was a stunningly prescient comment from him actually so like you know it's definitely a proud parenting moment even though i didn't understand it even at the time i didn't even understand what he meant at the time but later i found out wow what a great insight right but i but to me that was one reason which is i did not want to be that guy i did not want to be the i'm so smart watch me dazzle you with these math equations you have no idea what i'm talking about but for sure you want to buy my token right which is not what we need you know, we don't need that as an industry, right? But the other fundamental reason why I gave such a simplistic talk is everybody's buses seem to be going the wrong way, right? So, you know, to me, it's kind of like if we're all so dang smart, 
then why aren't more of us like more rich, right? I mean, it's a, it's obviously a, almost a locker room style insult, you know, but I, you know, I would say that like, to me, um, you know, it's, it, it is, it is rooting all the way back to the basics, right? Which is the basics are, you know, like make money buy your token, right? Like, you know, it's, it's that simple. And I, I feel like the thing that's disrespected in the industry is the reserve and the idea of the reserve to float ratio, you know, which is really the fundamental ratio that drives your economy. And it drives what I define as the definition of a good or bad economy, which is your economy is good. So, you know, your economy is good if you're able to buy back your token when you think it's cheap, right? And, you know, if you're not able to buy it back, then, you, you know, because definitely a bad economy is something that's, you know, basically a full death spiral, right? So it's hard to point at any particular facet and say, this is problematic, because everything's problematic when you're tanking, right? But, but what I do want to articulate is this, is your ability to buy tokens when they're cheap, those are the brakes on your car, right? So if you go out for a drive, and you have no brakes on your car, then you're eventually you are going to crash. Like I will, you know, so to me, like I will point at that because if you have brakes on your car, then you're fine. So what are the brakes? The brakes are the reserve, right? So from an economics and crypto economic perspective, you just really want to maintain a reserve. You can't maintain a reserve in your own token. And the reason why that's not possible is you need to buy back your token and you can't go into the market and say, I would like to buy back my token with my token. Like that makes no sense, right? The market won't appreciate you trying to do that. I mean, it will have no effect, you know? So to me, what it means is that you need a reserve that contains a basket of assets that you have determined will maintain or hold value, right? Whether they be so-called stable coins or, you know, things like Bitcoin or whatever it may be, you know, and tip the typical approach to this, if you look at the reserve banks or central banks of world governments and nations is obviously, you know, people tend to hold things like gold, US dollars, you know, and uh, obviously the thesis around de-dollarization is one where people are increasingly holding additional assets, you know, and uh, obviously that's a really interesting kind of like development. So I guess what I wanted to kind of swing it to is really a little bit also about the availability and structure of the capital markets. Right, which is that one of the things that is important to understand about private and venture capital is that we are in a period of uh, decline and decrease, right? So obviously with the winter segment, the thing that's interesting is we saw a peak of fundraising into venture capital as an asset class in 2021, 2022. So if you want to kind of study the data on this, you can look for a uh, pitch book because PitchBook is really kind of a VC data platform and they actually publish articles about what's happening, right? So if you if you Google PitchBook and you look for venture capital US, uh, you know, so if you look at the US fundraising of venture capital firms across the asset class, not Web3, just across the asset class, we're projected to be about 73% lower in 2023. Right. Obviously, it's only May 3rd of 2023, so we're not even halfway through the year. But if you draw a straight line to how we've been doing so far this year, we're going to end the year 73% lower than the previous year. Now, what does this mean for fundraising? What it really means, and you know, what, it, what does it mean for fundraising and navigating this, right? So you, know, you have to kind of understand the cycles in order to properly execute you know, uh, Web3. Right, because the cycles definitely are part of the kind of rhythms of volatility. Now, obviously, there's no way to make a forward looking statement and predict the future. But if you do believe that the Bitcoin halving provides sort of a historical catalyst for bull runs, right? And by the way, like um, when you look at this kind of shelling approach, it definitely starts to resemble things like meme coin economics, right? So if you look at these very strange things like GameStop or AMC or these sort of meme stocks, right, that are traded by like Wall Street bets on Reddit, right? Like these very, very strange runs are actually part of this very weird uh, phenomenon, you know, that I kind of characterize as 
Uh, it's very interesting, actually, because I, I, you know, I, I look at the Keynesian animal spirits and I kind of consider there to be a third animal spirit in the market called the honey badger, right? Which is that, you know, John Maynard Keynes obviously documented this almost shamanistic construct of the animal spirits of the bear and the bull, right? The bear goes to hibernate and the bull charges forward, right? So that's the quality of these things. You know, I, I've kind of postulated a third animal spirit, which is the honey badger, which basically predicts what you think it will do and tries to perversely do the exact opposite, right? Which is a, it's a very entertaining form of animal spirit, right? A contrarian animal spirit. But like, if we're to believe in the Bitcoin having thesis around the crypto cycle, then we really only have really another year of winter from this date, right? So to me, like what that means from a navigational perspective is, is that if you can conserve runway, in your current company, you know, until the next cycle begins, then you'll actually be at an advantage, right? Really based on kind of like raising money at the highest possible valuation, right? If you look at the other end of the extreme is if you have to, you should raise money as soon as possible, right? Because the vintage money that was raised in 2021, 2022 is actually actively being deployed now. So the de if you look at the depletion of the funds raised in 2023, you're actually seeing kind of that will actually start to hit a little bit later rather than sooner, right? So these are these are kind of the watchwords, you know, to try to understand the kind of characteristics of the industry, right? Because, you know, Gumi Crypto's capital, you know, we really raised our fund one around Bitcoin 17K, which is previous all-time high. And then we kind of raised our second fund closer to Bitcoin 60K, which is more recent all-time high, right? So like, in a sense, like, you know, we've been executing against the cycle fairly fruitfully. And I think for us, it gives us very, very stable and deep conviction in investing in the bear market. And right now we're deploying, you know, full speed, perhaps even accelerated as a function that we understood from the last cycle that our deployment window in the, into the winter was actually a little shorter than we wanted, right? That the bull market and rally started a little bit before we were even done deploying, you know? And so, you know, we feel like we are on a clock to deploy until the next cycle, right? And so the question becomes, why am I so confident in this next cycle? So I think one of the things that is utterly opaque is business timing of markets, right? Which is that markets do what markets want to do. So like, you know, I, I don't want anyone to kind of like come back in April of 2024 and said, you told me there would be a bull run, right? Because that that's, that's not what I'm trying to say, right? You know, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, there are periods of bullishness and periods of bearishness and we're in a period of bearishness right now right so like to me like there's a variety of different ways to navigate that obviously high conviction investors are super valuable and one of the great things about what's happening now for us is that we're meeting high conviction founders right so that makes our life much happier and that makes our job easier right because you know some of the founders that were just chasing you know whatever buzzwords, you know, at the bull height of the bull run, like, obviously, you know, it, it's not that we would mistakenly invest in such founders, it's rather that it just becomes so noisy, that it's hard to separate, you know, and conferences just fill up with hype, people hyping things, right. So I, I think that that's a that's a problem, right. So I think, to me, the thing that is about navigating the cycles, is like, if you look at the object lesson of something like, so co contrast something like Definity with something like Ethereum, right? So if you look at something like an open source project, open source projects by themselves have zero payroll and zero burn rate. So an open source project can basically quietly build software forever, right? And no one will bother them, right? The problem is if you take giant boatloads of venture capital, Right, then you have a problem because if you look at the venture capital fund life cycle, the fund life cycle, the average time to unicorn, according to super founders, uh, which is great data from Data Collective, is basically a four year median time to unicorn. And then it starts to taper around year seven. Right. And, and if you ask yourself, why is that? The reason why that is, is that there's a typical valley pattern of four year vesting. So it means that you 
you know, what happens is around year seven, you're three quarters of the way through your second vesting cycle, right? So what's happening is, is that your equity is pretty much bleeding out to the people who are building the company, right? So if you get all, if you get fully, you know, through your second vesting cycle, the question becomes how much incentive is left in the tank, right? Because the world's best founders, world's best kind of employees, you know, world's best talent, they're going to want reasonably sizable amounts of the balance sheet in order to do their work, right? So like, if you start running out of gas, you're not that exciting anymore to such investors, and you're not that exciting anymore to such founders, right? So like, you know, I think that these, that's a pretty important thing when it comes to kind of the classical Silicon Valley venture model, right? So what does that mean? You know, it means that the funds generally have to return to, you know, do shareholder return or, you know, LP return, you know, within their fund life cycle, right? So they're going to have to sell, right? That puts sell pressure into your token economy, right? And, you know, people need to kind of understand and respect the venture model, which is that, you know, VC companies are companies. You know, so they need to have a good relationship with their environment, you know, and I think that environment needs to kind of like, you know, they need to get more economic energy from their environment than they output. So uh, Lisa, your hand is up. Would love to hear your question. Yeah, when you say token economy, I'm just wondering if you're still referring to either tokens or equity. Yes. So, uh, you know, to me, like, I just want to clarify that the reasoning that I'm applying to equity and the reasoning I'm applying to tokens are reasonably exchangeable, right? Obviously, there's a fairly significant sort of regulatory construct to be aware of, right? Which is that, you know, it's to me, it seems fairly evident that most of the economics I'm describing describe effectively, you know, a Howie class security. Right. So if you are doing kind of token economics, you know, it makes sense for you to basically, you know, exclude U.S. persons, you know, to do KYC, you know, and to basically do kind of the appropriate things, you know, associated with this, depending on the legal domicile. I'm not a lawyer, so, you know, don't take this as legal advice. But, you know, really, when I talk about equity and tokens, right, like I'm talking about things like vesting, right? So like, obviously, you know, there's a lot of token economics that have things like token vesting, right? So like, you know, when you look at these kinds of things, I'm definitely talking about these two things almost interchangeably, you know, and the question becomes, what are the kind of mechanistic differences, right? So I think the mechanistic differences are that it's generally a little bit easier to distribute a much wider circle of tokens than it is to distribute a wider circle of equity, right? And, you know, th that general rule of thumb really more or less applies to non-US persons, you know, and obviously, you know, it's jurisdictionally bound, right? So like there may be, you know, jurisdictions that are, are as restrictive or more restrictive than the US, right? So like, you know, you need to be careful about how you execute such a plan, right? But what I'm really saying is this, right? Which is that, you know, whether it's token economics or equity economics, it's economics, right? So like, you know, that's why I'm able to compare something like Apple stock to something like ICP, because like these two things have, they're both fundamentally economic, right? The, the, the thing that I wanted to articulate though, is as an investor, early stage, we're most frequently buying uh, convertible equity with token warrants, right? Now, if you look at this kind of pattern, it sort of suggests this double dipping motion, right? It, 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 it suggests like, oh, they're getting equity and tokens, right? What we, what we really do hope in the long run is we really hope that one of these becomes the value capture mechanism and the other one basically goes away, right? I do think that, you know, Binance is one of the largest extant hybrid models where you have a gateway between the token BNB and you have a gateway between that and the company Binance, uh, I guess the Maltese company, right? And and that that company buys back and burns the token, right? So so that's a hybrid model. It's a hybrid model where equity exists, token exists, and they kind of have a relationship, right? Uh, long term, our hope and expectation would be that this not occur in most cases, right? And the reason why we kind of want one of them to win is because if they coexist 
and there's ever a conflict, the equity will always win, right? Because the equity has two things going for it. One of which is the equity will typically have fiduciaries, right? Who are legally obligated to demonstrate a duty of care, right? Tokens don't have fiduciaries, right? Which is, you know, and obviously you could argue on the side of the token that the tokens should have fiduciaries because they're securities. But the reality is, is that nobody's invented this concept of a token director, right? So it's like, oh, you're on the board of token directors. It's like, no, that doesn't exist. Nobody's ever been, to my knowledge, nobody's ever been appointed to that, right? So if you're like, this token is a security and as a security, it's managed by the board of directors. So we have equity directors who are the same people as token directors. like. That would make sense. You know, we just haven't seen people do that. So what happens in general is that the, if there's ever a fight, the token side will lose, right? Which I think is bad, right? So, you know, because an organization can pump the token and dump the equity, or they can pump the equity and dump the token, right? So if there's ever a fight, it feels like the logical thing for most corporations to do is to dump the token, right? So, so you know, uh, obviously, like, you know, in the greater world, the philosophy of coexistence is lovely, but I think in reality, tokens and equity, you know, can become into conflict. So why do we buy both? The reason we buy both is, is that in most early stage projects, we don't actually know what's going to happen. We don't even know what the value capture mechanism is. If you're pre-product market fit, you don't even know what the product is going to be. So how, how are you going to figure out what the value capture is going to be, right? So ultimately it's kind of like, we don't know. Let's get positions on both sides, you know, and however it plays out, let's participate, you know, because obviously the pure venture model is a win-win model, right? It has to be a win-win model. Um, I gave a talk at ETH Denver called VCs aren't evil, we're just predatory. And uh, I was tweeting this out, uh, you know, and it's, my tongue is in my cheek. It's it's supposed to be funny. And, and I, I, you know, I got a reply from actually one of my, a very legendary VC in Silicon Valley, uh, Vinod Kosla, you know, who retorted that the VC business is actually a positive sum business, right? So, so his idea was was that that you know VCs are more symbiotic than they are predatory, right? Because the symbiote is sort of like win win, right? Uh, you know, as opposed to win lose, right? And you know, obviously, when you think about other biological relationships, there's even parasitism, right? Where it's sort of like, that's win-lose, right? And predation is, you know, win-lose, you know, but obviously he's saying that, you know, VC is win-win, which I think he's actually correct. He's actually accurate when he says that, right? I'm just really trying to help entrepreneurs reason about VCs and why they do things. And, uh, you know, I think that metaphor has some utility, you know, but obviously as a metaphor, it's incomplete. You know, I just want to explain to them why VCs do things, you know, because ultimately, like any organism, it has to maintain a positive energy balance with its environment, right? And the thing to understand about it is, is that VCs don't general, unless they're incubators, like they generally don't build products, right? So really all, all they're dependent on founders to build products that people want to use. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't work out. Uh, yeah, I, I, Marianne, Marianne, you have your hand up. Yeah, so um, I don't know if you thought through this whole generative AI, uh, you know, evolution, revolution happening at the moment and how that's going to affect Web3, if at all. Yeah, so, uh, so as a venture person, there's two things that are really critical for my business. One of them is thesis, right, which is it's super important for me to generate investment thesis. So my contrarian investment thesis around AI is that there's not much for us to invest in. Right. And, you know, it's a very contrarian thesis because I'm watching, you know, hundreds of my cohort like dumping money into AI projects, you know, at, at blockchain and Web3 VCs, right? So to me, like, obviously, there's a ton of hype around this, right? I actually feel that it's really, really, really big, right? So I, I definitely get that it's big. But one of the ways that we think is, um, you know, uh, like, I consider Microsoft under Satya Nadella to be one of the most intelligent companies in the world. 
right? And, you know, the thing that's super insane is that obviously they're invested in open AI, right? So like, that's great, right? We should invest in open AI in the seed stage, right? So like, obviously that's not available, right? We're not able to do that, right? The thing that is a fundamental characteristic of AI, by the way, is that it has very sort of hot summers and it has very cold and very long winters, right? So, you know, and, and, and or spring, right? So people talk about AI spring, right? So it's like, oh, it's AI spring, let's go, right? So everyone gets super excited about it, right? And then after it doesn't kind of achieve AGI and sentience and things like that, then everyone gets really angry and they quit investing, right? So like, um, you know, so the best AI people in the industry who've been working on this for decades, right? They actually know this. They know that like this, these, these things hype really hot, right? So their best move is to use this hype to move from open AI to Microsoft or to move from Google to Microsoft or to move from Microsoft to open AI, right? And to command like a seven figure salary and to lock in like, you know, so those, that's what the best talent is doing. The best talent is actually not going into startups, right? So I hate to say that, right? Cause you know, so, so what's happening in startups is, is startups are using AI. So they become AI users, but where's the moat? Right. So, you know, to me as an investor, I do think that there's a really complex playbook where you could use AI as an early adopter, and then you can maybe try to shovel the use of AI into a network effect and the network effect becomes the mode. Right. But that feels like really complicated dance moves, you know? And so to me, when I look at kind of what we can invest in, if you actually watch Microsoft, uh, you know, they understand AI really well. They understand the metaverse really well. They understand VR really well. Like they built Holodeck, they built a bunch of VR stuff. You know, their version of a metaverse is Activision Blizzard gaming, right? So what's up with that? Well, one of the really scary things is recently Jason Kalkana said, well, it's likely that AI is going to take out about a third of uh, jobs in the knowledge profession, right? So like, that seems like a reasonable number, right? IBM said 7,200 jobs to be replaced by AI, right? So like, you know, obviously there's bigger and deeper cuts happening at places like Twitter, 80%, right? Now that that's happened, by the way, AI or no, Twitter hasn't died, right? So now Wall Street is going around to every other tech company and saying, why don't you slash 80% of your workforce? Because Twitter didn't die, right? So if Twitter didn't die, you won't die you know, start, right, go, right? So like, so one of the reasons why gaming continues to be interesting is, is that, you know, in, in tough economic times, people continue to pursue entertainment, right? And so, you know, so to me, like the thing that's really interesting becomes if the ripple is large enough, you can actually look at adjacencies, for example, something like education, right? So education is likely to be wholly transformed you know, and if it doesn't get transformed, then we're all in trouble, right? Because if we keep teaching kids things that AIs can do better than them, then we're a bad society, right? And so it means that we kind of have to do things differently. And that's a disruption. That's a massive disruption, right? So I guess what I'm trying to argue is, is, you know, the restructuring of education may actually be a user of AI, Right. So if someone comes to me and says, I'm using AI to restructure education, like that actually makes a ton of sense. Right. Because things like individual learning, right, where uh, where a bot is actually like, what does this person know and what do I need to teach them and how can I optimally feed them information, you know, and make sure that they're learning like that's probably an AI application, but I wouldn't invest in it as like a fundamental innovation in AI. Right. I would invest in it as education is going to be massively disrupted. You know, and I feel like the idea that I'm going to invest in companies that use AI, like that's just dumb. Like what I mean by that's just dumb is of course they're going to use AI, right? Like if, you, if, if you're not using AI, you're just dead, right? So like every company uses AI that's not dead, right? So like the idea, the idea of, wow, I have a great idea. I'm going to invest in companies that use AI. Like that's just a silly mindset. Like that doesn't make sense. Like all companies will use AI. And if they're solving something like education, that might make sense, right? That might be like investable, like that might be a good project, right? So, you know, for me, like we're looking for adjacencies. 
that's kind of our mindset, right? So, you know, you look downstream, you know, and you look at things like, Ooh, what's the, what's the, you know, what I, I kind of hate to forecast things like mass unemployment, but like, you know, AI can do a lot of things. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's surprisingly powerful at doing things. So. Can I ask a quick follow-up question to that? Yeah, um, of course. So yeah, Mariana and I have been talking about this, like we were at consensus last week and thinking about it from like the entertainment and gaming perspective. I mean, I guess a two part question, should all slide decks that deal with entertainment and gaming have a slide that says, you know, AI impact sort of like a securities filing has like, you know, how are we dealing with AI? How do we incorporate it? How does it change our business model going forward? I because definitely on the entertainment I, side, it goes from like everything from like totally user generated, like I could just talk to my AI chatbot all day and be entertained and have whatever I want appear at any time. I don't even need movies or games or anything or any narratives to, you know, more of a controlled, you know, use of AI, like you're saying, and like we would be doing that uses it in specific ways, but not others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would say this is I'm a sort of a bear. Uh, like I really, I really love the Sequoia pitch deck template, 10 slides, right? Very, very compact, right? So if I were, if I were a founder in the entertainment and I was making a pitch deck, I would restrict my commentary on AI to kind of a why now slide, right? Which is why now, right? And the why now would be, okay, like AI is going to disrupt work. You know, it's going to disrupt entertainment, right? And obviously you're going to say, hey, we can take advantage of AI to support things like user generated content, you know, so there's, there's advancements in, you know, because the thing that's really amazing when you think about things like UIs, right? Like if you look at UIs like Microsoft Office, right? Like Microsoft is disrupting itself by, by integrating OpenAI into Office. Right. So in a sense, like, because the point is, is that all these fiddly configurational AI uh, UIs are mostly going away, right? Because they're just going to be replaced by like a chat, a command line that you can just talk to, you know, or a voice chat, right? But like, if you look at gaming UIs, gaming UIs won't go away because people want to embody themselves in these 3D worlds and see all the colors and, you know, get all the enjoyment. And if, if anything the gaming AI is going to get even richer and more colorful and more exciting and more beautiful. And, you know, so, you know, so in a sense, like, you know, when you, cause again, I think we could all benefit from just studying the footwork of Microsoft, right? Because I just think they're an incredibly well-run company. If you actually look at the math of what they've done, Azure is basically hugging the machine and the gaming business is hugging the human. Right. And that's the shape of Microsoft. Most other lines of business are kind of more are becoming more incidental, which is kind of shocking. Even things like flagships like Windows and Office are coming more becoming more economically incidental to the mothership, you know, than than this kind of like new structure, right? Which is embracing kind of the human in entertainment and embracing the machine in the form of cloud. Right. So that's that's a great structure obviously when you look at the evolution of amazon there's sort of this flagship e-commerce e store but what about their eight billion dollar acquisition of mgm right so now you're seeing a billion dollar expense line going towards something like um the lord of the rings you know and you start to scratch your head about questions like that and here's another interesting impact on the idea of of um entertainment which is there's just more of us to entertain these days, right? So the planet recently crossed the milestone at the end of last year of 8 billion humans, right? Now it's projected that we're going to see it taper to maybe 10 and then maybe decline from there or maybe hold from there, right? So it's not infinite expansion of humans, but 8 billion is a lot of humans, right? So like the idea that you can spend a billion dollars to make entertainment becomes a little less dumb if you think about how many people could possibly be entertained by that right so so that that you know so that that to me is another kind of a why now construct you know and obviously if we see ai disruption of employment it's gonna get strange uh i i feel like entertainment is is going to become super important uh and i think microsoft understands that they're they're 
they're very thoughtful. That's just what I, that's, that's been my observation is they, they, they've been executing well, right? Like they obviously didn't break their pick on VR the way Zuckerberg did. Right. And I just think they're just making decisions, right? Like they, they know about all these things, you know, they're just deciding to do what they're doing, which I think is incredibly smart. So their entire metaverse is like Activision Blizzard, right? And, you know, hopefully the UK antitrust regulator will allow that deal to go through because, you know, I think it's, I think it's fine. Xbox Game Pass, great product, you know, put in, put in World of Warcraft and stick all that stuff in there. It'll be fine. Anyhow. That's my hot take on AI. Just a couple more things. I think we have a couple minutes left here. I, I could spend hours with you, Miko, as always. But um, the whole idea of NFTs and metaverse and all these, you know, kind of Web3 concepts, which, if any of those, do you feel will be still sort of relevant within this next year or so? Yeah, so obviously NFT is going through a great period of kind of mass extinction, right? Obviously, you know, uh, we invested in the seed stage, we led the strategic seed round into OpenSea, right? So we watched this kind of Cambrian explosion of NFT, you know, obviously we're seeing kind of like this period of mass extinction, you know, and I think to me, the next wave of NFT is really, really focused on you know, utility. So I think gaming NFT, governance NFT, you know, we're increasingly seeing the emergence of governance NFT as a function of projects, right? So one of the really weird things becomes this one token, one vote paradigm, right? The thing that I think people are, it's that's funny about that is that that turns governance into sort of a pay to win game, right? And in a sense, the thing that's really interesting about the role of NFT and governance is that it actually allows for something that's more community-based, right? And obviously it's centralized, right? So NFTs are largely centralized, you know, not as a function of their presence on a blockchain, but it's centralized in terms of the utility that, you know, the utility that the person's entitled to is often centralized in a provider, right? So like, for example, our company Hashflow uh, has been using NFTs to give their users kind of almost like loyalty bonuses, discounts on exchange, like lots of cool and voting rights and things like that, right? So to me, you know, increasing the thing that I think is exciting about the use of an NFT for these use cases is that those are fundamentally non-dilutive and they don't contribute to the, you know, increase in the, uh, you know, float you know, against your reserve, right? So, so it doesn't send your float ratio out of whack, right? So the use of NFTs to kind of represent loyalty and represent membership and represent belonging and kind of presumably to kind of recognize people who clearly care about your community, I think it becomes a really interesting mechanism and non-dilutive mechanism, right? So, you know, in the long run, we definitely, I definitely do see NFT is really interesting. One of the definitions of the metaverse that I heard that I really like is the idea of player created history. And the thing that I think is exciting about the idea of player created history, if you look at uh, Hilmar's CCP games, creator of EVE Online, you know, they just took a $40 million investment from A16Z to bring the EVE Online metaverse, you know, into Web3. Right. And the thing that I think is exciting about something like EVE Online is the entire history of the game is the history of space battles and conquest that players have performed. Right. So in essence, if there's, you know, if you go into like their version of Wikipedia and you look at the these epic space battles, you know, as a player, you can be like, I participated in that. Like I participated in that conquest. I was this little pirate fleet that signed on as a mercenary to like fight this big cruiser and we won or whatever, whatever, whatever. Right. But my point is, is that the idea of player created history becomes really interesting and part of something that I call gamer centric transmedia. Right. And so increasingly, so for example, recently the world's most popular video game based movie uh, became the Mario movie. Right. So that's interesting because the previous generation winner was actually the World of Warcraft movie. And I'll tell you the difference between gamer centric and non gamer centric, which is that in the Mario movie, you can actually tell which buttons the characters on the screen are hitting. Right. So you can be like, oh, they just hit the jump button. 
right? That's super player centric, right? So if you're a gamer and gamer centric, you're watching the movie and you're actually watching someone effectively almost playing a game. Another example is uh, Netflix Arcane, which takes place in the Runeterra universe created by League of Legends by Riot Entertainment, right? So, you know, no spoilers, but there's characters in there that kind of perform their ultimate ability, you know, which gamers will perform by pressing R, right? So the thing that's amazing about the gamer centricity is you'll see the character on screen pressing R. Like, you'll, you, you know, so the all the viewers who play the game are actually like, they just, they're feeling the game. Like, they're like, this is for me. This is built for me, around me, right? If you look at the World of Warcraft movie, the feeling the gamer gets is this is a disgusting exploitation of the thing that I have enjoyed, right? It's like, I love this game. This movie is awful. What a disaster, right? The only reason why it made such a big box office is that they sold the hell out of it in China. And that was the game plan. The entire game plan was, let's take this over to China, sell the hell out of it. They made a ton of money, but they did it on the backs of gamers. And I think that the pendulum swinging back the other way, right? So for Mario game to get a 57% critic tomato meter and a 97% fan tomato meter and a billion dollar box office is the triumph of gamer centric transmedia. Like, like, you know, we get the gamers have won the gamer gaming is now culture, right? So that that's, that's, you know, so ga the gamers have the upper hand. So that's, that's only going to continue. Anyhow, uh, I have a whole rant on that, but I know we're at the top of our time. So I uh, appreciate the uh, time here. 180 billion later, still growing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think I want to thank you for this presentation. If anyone has any other questions, I know I have millions of them. Um, we can maybe talk about some of the stuff in the clubhouse today. But Miko, this was really helpful. Uh, the, how do you deal with this super fast changing environment? As you, you know, you told your limited, you're going to do this with a fund and then all of these things kind of come to bear in maybe a quarterly changes versus, you know, three or four year change in increments. Yeah, so absolutely, you know, for me, obviously, if I want to hear about the far future, you know, far sci reading science fiction is wonderful. You know, uh, if you think about cyberpunk fiction, like it's stuff that uh, William Gibson, you know, obviously Neil Stevenson, who I got to speak with recently, like the, these authors really incredibly predict the far future. You know, for me professionally, I'm really only allowed to think about runway time which is 12 to 24 months, what's going to happen. And then I'm allowed to think about fund life cycle time, which is about four to seven years, right? So, you know, in a way, like if the business timing doesn't fit in my model of what happens in that time frame, like then it doesn't really work, right? But the thing that's really exciting is, is it turns out that in aggregate over it, so over a year's time, almost nothing changes, but in 10 years time, everything's crazily different, right? And the best way you can do that is you can actually try to look back on the decades, like the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, right? So when you kind of think about times like that, it does make you realize that, okay, things actually really, really do change, right? And, and you know, things like pre-iPhone, post-iPhone, like, you know, there's the rise of like Uber on top of iPhone, you know? So there's definitely like just enablers of incredible change. You know, so I just feel like that's the best way to try to like back into this is think about these two time frames, you know, and maybe in your spare time, think about like the long, long, long time frame. Super helpful. Thank you so much. I was just wondering if you asked Neil whether he predicted the metaverse would be such a super hit with Snow Crash. If he, like yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I actually asked him uh, how he currently defined the metaverse. Right. Mm -hmm. And he didn't take a crack at it, actually. He actually said, I can only assert that the metaverse has to be fun. Right. Which I think was really nice. I think it's really smart of him. And I think that that's what Satya Nadella is thinking. Right. In other words, Satya is like gaming, right? Like the gaming, mm -hmm. like if you actually go today to a top brand and you're like, what's your strategy in the metaverse? The, a top brand will, if a top brand is smart, they're going to be like, it's Fortnite and Roblox, right? So that's what they think the metaverse is, right? And so like, it's gaming, like it's already, we're already there, right? And so to me, like the idea of the metaverse will have to be fun. In a way, it's a pretty strong backlash against things like 
Zuckerberg's like horizon, right? Which is, it's basically like, why, you know, like, why, like, why would we do that? Right. And I think the answer is it's novel isn't a good answer because like human habituation turns novel things into boring things within like 14 days. Right. Whereas like, it feels like fun is something that's reasonably durable. I mean, there's games that I, there's certain specific games I've played for years in a stretch. So like, you know, fun things can just stay fun, which is pretty nice. Thank you so much for all the wisdom. I wish your presentation was at the beginning of the academy and not at the tail end. I hope some of the presentations of the founders will change by May 23rd. You're invited to the pitch session. I'll send you a separate invitation via email. And just want to thank you so much for spending time with us. This was a great learning experience as always. Thank you. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I, I do engage, so you can tweet and happy to chat over there. Miko Java. Thank you so much, Miko. Thank you, everyone.